Good afternoon. Today's speaker is Rashmi Sadana, uh, uh, one of our two Weatherhead resident scholars. Uh, Rashmi is the Associate Professor of Anthropology at George Mason University. Her PhD is from the University of California, Berkeley, and she has an MA from SOAS, the School of uh, Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Um, she's received grants from the American Council of Learned Societies. That, that's a tough one to get and says a lot about her, her scholarship. The American Institute of Indian Studies and the National Science Foundation. Um, her fieldwork is largely focused on changing forms of identity in urban India. And I, I'm impressed by the strikingly diverse uh, range of topics on which she's published. Um, her first book is called English Heart, Hindi Heartland, The Political Life of Literature in India. It was published in 2012. Um, but she's also published on city planning. And of course, we'll hear about uh, transportation, public transportation, and its cultural impact. So I give you Rashmi Sadam. Thank you. Thank you. I first want to thank SAR for this opportunity to present my research today and to be in residence uh, for this academic year. I'll be showing a number of photographs to accompany my talk today. Um, I took them at various stages in my research, and I really think of them as part of my ethnographic field notes. There's one newspaper photo that I didn't take, and I'll point that out when we get to it. So my talk today is an overview of the book I'm currently writing on the Delhi Metro, which is a mega infrastructure urban rail project that the government of India started building in 1998. The first trains ran in 2002, and now in 2019, the third phase of construction is just about being completed. My project has followed these three main construction phases, as the system has extended spatially over time. Anthropologists Hannah Apple, Nikhil Anand, and Akhil Gupta have aptly described the building of metro systems as, quote, the slowness of the process of speeding up. I've been researching this slowness for the past 10 years and have been trying to understand what the speeding up has meant for the people of Delhi. My interest in the metro stemmed from what I saw as a seismic shift in how the city was being experienced and perceived in the mid to late 2000s. I was living and commuting in Delhi for the first few years of my research, and I was taking the metro most days. I use ethnographic methods. I've clocked about 4,000 hours on the trains, on platforms, around stations, observing but also talking to people on and off the, the trains about their metro experiences, their itineraries, and their aspirations. Over the years, I've also done numerous formal and informal interviews and had discussions with metro officials, engineers, architects, urban planners, politicians, and bureaucrats. Unlike uh, most urban anthropology, which perhaps more wisely focuses on bounded communities by ethnicity or neighborhood, my project is radically multi-sided within one city, as I connect diverse places with people's everyday experiences and ideas. The connective thread is the metro as a concrete set of lines and stations but also as a symbolic space, a global emblem of modernity, and for the city of Delhi, a master urban plan. 
My premise is that as a form of mass transit that has taken root on this scale for the first time in South Asia, the Delhi Metro offers a new way to theorize the Indian urban, but also enables us to think more broadly about transnational urbanization. That is how cities respond to and learn from each other or, or don't. And this includes issues of sustainability and social inequality as more and more of the world urbanizes and at a faster rate than ever before. I contend that the metro in Delhi is a new public formation, enabling a new relation among strangers and between citizens and the state. It is a terrain of power and contestation in the city, a technology of liberal rule by the government, and a zone of cultural debate for society at large. It is also a material and aesthetic imposition on the urban landscape. I use the metro as an analytic to understand these aspects of urbanism and contemporary life in Delhi, and my talk today will detail some examples of how I do this. This is Chauri Bazaar station in Old Delhi, the old city. It is the deepest station in the network, and because of the contrast with the centuries-old structures above ground and the new metro technology below ground, it's sometimes called the time machine station. While metro systems are nothing new, I've found the interface of Delhi's metro with the city to be rich with ethnographic potential especially for the study of gender and class mobility and the politics of urban development. As an Asian megacity of 20 million, Delhi, like Beijing, Hong Kong, Seoul, and other cities, has had its metro built on top of and under an already highly developed, socially complex, and densely populated place. Delhi has one of the most high-tech metro systems in the world, drawing on transnational technologies and global expertise from a range of countries. Over the last 15 years, most of the production has become indigenized, and now India advises other countries on how to build metro systems. You could say that the metro has become part of India's brand. Within India itself, dozens of new metro systems are being constructed or planned in cities including Mumbai, Chennai, Jaipur, Lucknow, Kochi, and Hyderabad. The success of those other systems remains a big question. My talk today will highlight some of the contradictions of implementing a capital-intensive mega-project that privileges higher-end property development and a globalized middle-class lifestyle in a city where the majority of people are low income and ride the bus. As the Delhi Metro enters its 18th year of operation, the system has grown to have nine lines and over 270 stations, carrying about three million passengers a day. The Metro travels across 230 miles of urban space, making it the eighth longest system in the world. There is a fourth construction phase planned that will further extend some of the existing lines. Now, a quarter of the system is underground, while most of it is elevated, as seen here in this photo. There are a couple of things to notice about this photo. The first is how the metro literally transforms the urban landscape. That is to say, what you see changes, but also how the city looks from different vantage points changes. The second thing is how the metro is always linked to other forms of transport. While the metro is responsible for 4% of daily trips in the city, motorcycles and scooters represent almost 22%. The third thing to notice is how the system is forging the city's urban planning, largely through property development that springs up around stations. In this case, at Vaishali Station on the Blue Line, there are dozens of new middle-class housing units that have been built. And on the left uh, side of the photo, you can see um, an, a billboard advertising more of this kind of housing to come. So 
So this map will give you a sense of the overall geography of the metro and its reach. Um, the yellow part marks the Union Territory of Delhi, while the white tags designate metro stations. Uh, the blue squiggly line is the Yamuna River. The purple is the state of Uttar Pradesh, the most populous state in India. And the pink is the state of Haryana, which actually borders Delhi on three sides. Delhi is the largest urban area in India, spanning 1,500 square kilometers, about 600 square miles. The city is a valley in the Gangetic Plain and spreads in all directions. Delhi's ever-expanding borders have gotten some definition with the metro and its map. You can see that the metro covers central parts of the city, but also extends across what's known as the National Capital Region or NCR. Although the idea for a metro rail system in Delhi emerged in the Nehruvian era of industrialized mega projects such as dams in the 1960s, the establishment of the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation or DMRC only happened in 1995. The DMRC is a half central government, half Delhi state government agency that built and manages the system. It is a management company and brand that links to 500 private contractors. Its headquarters, pictured here on Barakamba Road in central Delhi, has a corporate feel, unlike the rest of the low-lying government offices in this commercial and bureaucratic hub of the city. There are multiple electronic security gates and protocols to enter the building. And once inside, as you ascend the glass elevators, you feel like you are part of the technology. The metro may have been hatched in the quasi-socialist Nehruvian era, but it has very much become a product of the globalized neoliberal Indian one. 60% of the metro's funding comes from the Japanese government in the form of loans. And the Delhi metro is just one of the hundred or so Japanese infrastructure projects in India. Why the project took off in the 1990s was very much part of the diplomatic back and forth between the Indians and the Japanese who were keen to invest in India. And of course, this also has to do with India's biggest neighbor uh, and who they share a border with, um, China. The DMRC, as an entity and force in the city, valorizes the technocrat over the bureaucrat. It aims to get rid of corruption and red tapeism as it brings a new work ethic where workers arrive on time and deadlines are met. So it really aims to bring a new culture of work into um, the city and the country. DMRC officials believe that the metro's order and cleanliness will rub off on people and make them more in touch with their civic sensibilities. The metro is seen by the DMRC as a social institution as much as transport infrastructure. Even metro crowds have come to symbolize a new social order and the metro itself a kind of governance. An aspect of this order homogenizes people's behavior creating new norms, such as going through turnstiles, using electronic ticket cards, navigating, sliding train doors, behavior, all the behavior required for the trains to operate safely and run on time. So you could say there is a pedagogic function to the metro in terms of the new routines and bodily comportments required, but also in the way the DMRC promotes the system. For one, the DMRC has expanded the idea of safety in the city. This has much to do with the high-tech environment of the system, the lights, slick flooring, and CCTV cameras, but also the experience of each individual who must go through airport-like security to enter any station in the system. The metro only carries bodies that have been searched. The security is real, but it is also a display. We are all on display as we go through metal detectors, a body search, women behind a small curtain, men out in the open, 
and then place our belongings on the scanner belt. The metro creates a new form of mobility for millions, as well as a mass system of surveillance in the city. I should mention that the design feature that many Indians encountered for the first time on the metro were the escalators. There were few escalators in the city before the coming of the metro. They started first to come with the malls. Um, and malls, of course, are very middle class spaces, so not everybody goes to the malls. And still today, when I talk to some people about their early experiences on the trains, they mention, usually with a chuckle, um, about the drama of going on an escalator for the first time and the feeling of being unmoored. So the sense of speed on the metro is not just a forward motion, but can be an upward or downward one as well. Uh, this photo I took very early on in my research and will give you a sense of what sparked my imagination in relation to this project and the kinds of questions that I'm addressing. This is the original Mundy House station in central Delhi that first opened in 2006. It has since been remade into an interchange station. But in those early days, the line where the station and the city met, so you can see the, the sort of uh, dirt road where it meets the, the step there. This was, to me, this was the line where the station and the city met was still clearly visible in the crumbling stones at the far end of it. At Mundy House, I started to contemplate what urban space was and to ask, when does space turn into a place? When will this line dissolve? This is a project about space and place, but also different registers of time and how pastness gets incorporated or revised into future plans. This image also emphasizes how Delhi's metro was built as a standalone project, a high-tech artifact placed onto the city's already dense landscape. The metro was built as an engineering project, not as a part of an interconnected transit system where metro connects to bus, connects to railways. And in fact, the city's urban planning agencies were kept away uh, by the DMRC <clears throat> in the first and second phases of construction. It was unclear early on what was supposed to happen when someone got down from the metro and stepped across the threshold from the smooth and gleaming station to the uneven city terrain. In a sense, the metro was supposed to stand apart even if that goes against the logic of what public transport is supposed to do in the end. And the DMRC didn't want the system to be infected by issues relating to archaeological finds at station sites or even whether there should be toilets in the stations. They were pushed over the years by NGOs and even other government agencies the whole way, but also the DMRC had the power to pick and choose what they wanted to respond to. As one Delhi architect told me, the Metro's one failure is its lack of integration with the city. Nevertheless, as years have passed, all kinds of vendors and other forms of transport appear ad hoc at stations. Um, you can see the, the auto rickshaws pulling up here. So there is a question of people's actual mobility in the city in the everyday and the mobility or advancement of the city, its urban planning and development as a whole. The stations became central to my analysis since they not only relay passengers but are also a vast set of new public places, places to wait but also just to be and to forge new social and economic ties. So for instance, in a society where young people often um, hide their romantic relationships from their families, transport, uh, previously buses, but now especially the metro, is a site of meeting up and spending what little time together they have in transit. And I've also seen that the stairs leading into and out of certain metro stations have become sites for couples to break up and then literally go their separate ways. Um, I have done interviews with them sometimes in this process, which is sometimes awkward. 
Um, so ties can be both forged and broken at metro stations. This photo captures a second way in which my research imagination was initially sparked. Because the metro is elevated, especially as you get out of the central core of the city, people can see Delhi at a close distance, above but not far beyond. The city doesn't become too abstract. The metro is high in a low city, low, low built city. It's real what you see, birds on rooftops, people talking in their kitchens, on cell phones, the latest educational institutes, specialty hospitals, gyms, malls, and the brown expanse as you head out of the city. And it made me ask, what does all of this seeing do to people of the urban landscape and of others on the train? I've learned from commuters that it's just enough distance to allow perspective and consideration, and it enables people to read the landscape and to create connections between themselves and the city in a new way. The philosopher Charles Taylor would call this a metatopical space, one that feeds a new social imaginary by creating a new kind of common understanding. And I would say that this is how a metro public comes into being, through the very materials of infrastructure, in this case, windows on a moving elevated train. So the story of the metro is also a story of Delhi's roads and what is on them. Infrastructures connect to other infrastructures and can also be a response to them. Since the liberalization of the Indian economy in the 1990s, cars are attainable like never before. There are about 1,200 new cars on the road each day. Even if car trips are only 19% of total trips a day, they are the fastest growing sector in private transportation. And this is why sometimes when people ask me, oh, so with the metro, is there less traffic? Is there less pollution? And unfortunately, the answer is no to both of those questions. If reaching the Indian middle class used to be marked by the possession of a refrigerator and a scooter, now it is marked by having your own car, private car. The influx of cars on Delhi's roads in the 1990s brought more pollution, but also new levels of anxiety, more accidents, incidences of road rage, and perhaps most significant, a narrative about the treacherousness of the city, city's buses, which were in, co in competition for road space with all the new cars. This fear of the road and buses contributed to the idea of the metro being, having sprung organically from local needs, the treacherous, polluted, jam-packed roads, and is part of the official discourse of the DMRC itself for why Delhi had to have a metro and why now all these other Indian cities have to have metros. However, as urban transport researchers Dinesh Mohan and Geetam Tiwari have documented, well before the metro was, uh, or while it was being built, but also before, the need of the day in terms of Delhi transport has been for some time and is still the expansion and upgrading of its bus system in order to best meet the requirements of the majority of Delhi commuters. To the 4% of metro trips I mentioned, 40% of daily trips are on city buses. Even the metro is dependent on bus feeder systems, which relay five times more trips than the metro itself. But these facts do not always correspond to the urban imaginaries and desires that become so central to aspirational planning and development. Nor do they correlate to the political will that helps to get things done. The reason for the Metro's success in terms of being built on time, within budget, and to an international standard was somewhat simply that it had the complete support of the central and state governments. This is the one photo I didn't take. <laughs> As the metro network in Delhi continues to expand in phases, the city's first bus rapid transit, or BRT, corridor 
which ran for six kilometers in South Delhi, was dismantled in 2016 by the Delhi government's ruling Aam Admi Party, or People's Party, uh, after the BRT was deemed to be a failure. The failure was largely based on the class uh, based antagonism, upper class private car driving commuters reserved for the buses passing them by on the road. You can see from this Agence France press photo where the outrage stemmed from. Car drivers saw buses full of lower income Deliites passing their private vehicles. In fact, studies showed that it didn't take cars longer to travel the six kilometer stretch. It just sped up the buses. But the experience of the bus rapid transit corridor enraged the South Delhi driving class. So the ruling party, even though it bills itself as the People's Party, took the decision to get rid of the corridor. One senior bureaucrat who was instrumental in the planning of the metro told me that if the first line of the Delhi metro had started construction in South Delhi, the bastion of elite society, the project may never have gone forward. The debate over the BRT corridor became one of the ways in which social and transport mobilities intersect. The road also sets the scene for the metro and a politics of speed. Who gets to move the most quickly? Who avoids traffic? Who gets stuck in it? And whose vehicles are allowed to take up the most space? In Delhi, the hierarchy of vehicle size and number of wheels correlates to social position and class, but public transit can upset those logics. People love the metro because of what it symbolizes, a globalized modernity that they and their city is a part of, a modernity that they can step into, while a bus rapid transit corridor becomes an affront and ultimately a relic an infrastructure that disappears. Voids are open areas. Solids are built up, one architect tells me. The relationship between voids and solids creates a city's geometry, a meeting of angles and spaces, points and lines, places and beings a city becomes in its properties and relations. The curve and arc of the metro line forms a necklace around Okla industrial area that divides two neighborhoods and creates an open space framed by the metro tracks above. I learned from the residents living in informal settlements around the station that the metro is a talisman, albatross, and jewel. The station itself is a big yellow box, warehouse-like, with escalators at the front and cows grazing out back in the muck. People go up and look out. They are the new surveyors of the land and environs. Some things have stayed in place. The grape seller with the metro station to his back, the bicycle fixer who regards the metro with suspicion. Aircell, a leading mobile phone provider, its ad speaks to both constituencies here, those riding the trains and those living in the informal settlements just below the metro line. Seema, a fruit seller who lives in the area, tells me that she wants to be relocated to a metro colony where she knows that those whose houses were, were destroyed to make the metro have gone. I tell her it's far away from the central areas of the city and that the so-called metro colony is not accessible by the metro. She doesn't seem to care. She is concerned with her quality of housing. If it is pakka, and pakka means like fully built concrete, or not. Her housing, as it is now placed next to the metro, appears more fragile, while it has also become more visible and more legible. The metro at once dwarfs and draws attention to. To see the elevated trains each day overhead is to be reminded of the possibility of good construction and of the will of the government. This will becomes a subject of debate among residents here. 
on the roads and alleyways around the station, a narrative about Bada and Chota Admi, big and small men, emerges. Those living in the settlements next to the metro line see the object as having been built by the government for those already working for the government. There may be some Chota Admi or little men who ride the metro, but really, they tell me, the metro is to increase the power and mobility for those that already have some. Water trucks pull up to one settlement just below the metro line, and this, as you can probably tell, is the exact same angle, this photo I've taken, it's the same metro line. A politics of fast transport and slow water is revealed. Ram Shankar, a bicycle fixer I visit with from time to time, tells me, there was water shortage under Sheila's reign, Sheila Dixit, who was the former uh, chief minister of Delhi. But there was more corruption. You didn't see water trucks much. A few people would stand for three hours in lines to take water and sell it for profit. You can't get food or salary, but you can get water. Now the water trucks come two to four times a week, which is at least 50% more often than before. The metro, unlike water trucks, offers no durable good. It gives an energy and potentiality a forward motion, for many, no doubt. But it can also emphasize a kind of stagnation. Raj, who sells shirts and slacks on the side road between the metro and the offices of industrial Okla, outfits every man and sees himself as somewhere between a bara and chota admi, or big and small man. He takes the metro every day from North Delhi, from the old city to Okla, but cautions that others don't ride it. It's too expensive for them. They prefer to take the bus. To whom then will resources be distributed and from whom will they be withdrawn? This is the live drama that happens under the metro line each day in Okla. Still, groups of local women gather to sit and chat under trees on the station premises. Once a month, they take the metro two stops away to the Kalkaji Mandir or temple it's such a short distance that it's cheaper and not that much slower to take the bus or even walk. But riding the metro to the temple has become part of their experience. At Kalkaji station, the metro premises lead into the temple, making the experience complete. Once you exit the station, you simply follow a path around to the temple, and soon you are walking barefoot on wet stone. There are different constituencies served by the metro, one of them being women in the city. The ladies' coach of the metro has been another site of social and political significance that I have explored in this project. The metro is a response to an already gendered urban space, and the ladies' coach further shapes that space, beginning with its very name. It is a women-only car, usually the first car of the train, and as you can see here, the area for boarding is designated on the platform itself with pink signage. The ladies' coach didn't always exist. It was instituted in October 2010. And I should first tell you what it was like to ride the metro before there was a ladies' coach, um, which was the case for the first seven years. It was a kind of revelation. Um, it felt like a new kind of social space in Delhi. Men and women related to each other in a more relaxed way compared to other public places in the city. And this was largely because men didn't stare on the metro as they do on streets and buses. There was a kind of respectfulness in the air. And this certainly had to do with the newness of the technology and the real pride that people had in the system itself. More practically, it had to do with the lighting. It was really bright in metro cars, unlike the buses. And also unlike the bus, the bench-like seats of the metro trains face each other along the length of the train. So you're sitting next to and across from people rather than having people behind you. Men still outnumbered women, almost four to one, but there were a lot of women in each coach. Some women would tell me, 
men have to deal with our presence and growing presence in these kinds of spaces. However, as we know, riding a less crowded bus or metro feels quite different than riding one that is crowded or jam-packed. And when the Delhi metro became jam-packed, there were instances of sexual harassment and even stalking, which of course happens in just about every metro in the world. It's a major problem in London and New York. But the difference was that the DMRC, the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, wanted zero bad publicity for their metro. And they did not want their metro system to be compared to what goes on in buses or on streets. And so then project manager of the metro, E. Shridran, the engineer who was credited with the success of getting the system built, which was no small thing, made a unilateral decision to institute a women-only coach on each train. So women travel in the ladies' coach a few feet from and in full view of the men standing or sitting, in this case, in the open pathway between the ladies and general coaches. The space is fluid even as the very categories of women and men get reinforced. Delhi's lady coach uh, also connects symbolically to other cities in the world that have women-only cars on their metro or subway systems, such as Rio, Cairo, Tehran, Guangzhou, Tokyo, Mexico City. So there are two circulations to think about here. The one in this particular city and the one between cities across the world. To what extent do these segregated spaces reconstitute patriarchal norms even as they may increase women's mobility in the city? The ladies' coach designates a place while it also promotes an idea with its dominance of middle-class styles of dress, bodily comportments, and gestures. The ladies' coach is a space of class reproduction par excellence. It encapsulates the kind of aspirational activity that goes on in the metro, where in this case, women survey and emulate other women. The first time I ride the metro with Seema, a domestic worker from East Delhi, I reach for my electronic metro card while she gets in line to buy a token, paying instead for a point-to-point -point ride. I follow her lead and also get a token, and we board a general coach together. Seema never takes the ladies' coach. She makes a face when I ask her why, and her gesture says it all. The women are far more troublesome than any fear she has about being harassed. In my years of riding the Delhi Metro, often in the ladies' coach, and talking to women who ride in both, the ladies and general, I have certainly heard more praise of it than condemnation. Many women tell me they simply wouldn't ride the Metro if it were not for the ladies' coach, while some tell me their families would not let them ride it alone if it were not for the ladies' coach. Other women feign indifference. They like having the option to ride, in the ladies' coach, but sometimes ride in the general coach too. Still others complain about the behavior of women in the ladies' coach, most often that younger women will not give up seats for pregnant or older riders. Brinda, who rode Delhi buses for years and now takes the metro, tells me, people think metro is for relax. It's my space, and if I adjust for someone else, it takes away my privacy. Men sometimes complain that the general coaches are too crowded, while the ladies' coach is often less so, so it's a waste of space. Other men are glad for the ladies' coach when women in their family are traveling solo. It is common to see men board the ladies' coach and quickly pass through the vestibule connecting to the general coach. On occasion, men will sit in the ladies' coach and only move once they become intimidated enough by the women staring at them. There are fines posted and guards who sometimes shoo the men into another coach. On one memorable occasion that made newspaper headlines, a female guard stopped a group of men who had entered the ladies' coach, brought them back onto the platform, and ordered them to do sit-ups, which they did. <laughs> That's not the official policy of the DMRC. <laughs> The ladies' coach puts the idea and reality of women in public space center stage. 
It is an everyday embodied experience for thousands of women, a symbol of the limits and possibilities of gendered relations in public, and a perpetual policy question that hangs over transport infrastructures in the city. So I want to conclude um, with the question of the urban and the rural, which has been so central to the anthropology of India. India was for a long time vastly rural and agricultural with over 95% of people living in rural areas. The big Indian story in the last 50 years has been rural to urban migration and the growth of cities. Um, and now about 40% of Indians live in cities. That still leaves the majority in more rural areas, but younger generations in those areas are hoping for non-agricultural livelihoods. So the story today is really about the relationships between rural areas, small towns, and bigger cities, and the kinds of crisscrossing that happens between them for jobs, education, marriage, so the dichotomy of urban and rural has certainly loosened and fallen by the wayside in some respects, largely due to globalization and the digital revolution, as our idea of space and distance has changed so much. Yet, there's still a way in which we need to understand and conceptualize more urban ways and more rural ways, because these ways of being and thinking are still distinctive. Um, in people's lives, even if the urban and the rural are more connected than ever before. I believe Delhi's metro gives us a new analytic to think about the urban as a kind of unraveling space. It is not that the urban ends at the end of the line, but rather that it becomes frayed and its threads get picked up by those coming from further away or just elsewhere. Um, here on this map, if you can see the green line that cuts due west across the city, uh, that's what I want you to focus on, the green line. So for a long time, the line stopped at a station called Mundka. And from there, half-built metro, metro stanchions rose up in the distance uh, to support future stations. This was a key ethnographic site for me for a couple of years. It was where you stepped out of the station and saw, saw cow dung paddies and a growing urban village to one side, and on the other, where you could catch a jeep or bus to the Haryana state border. But now those future stations have been built, and the line extends to the city of Bahadurgar in the state of Haryana, so the very end station you see there, which is called City Park Station. City Park Station marks the end of the green line. At City Park, things are quieter, less crowded, with people and traffic as compared to earlier stops on the green line. I take the open air escalator down from the station. To my surprise, the first thing I see in a small park adjacent to the station is a photo shoot something I might associate with tonier areas in the city. Two young men dressed in jeans and white shirts are doing the posing. Another man holding a large professional camera with a telephoto lens is taking the photos. I keep going down and reach street level where I see the same National 10 highway, this highway you see in the photo, that bypasses Munka station and this one as well. Here, there are only a couple of street food vendors, but no rickshaw stand. The area around the station is still being built up. I meet a lone woman who is standing by the side of the road, trying to catch one of the big buses that keeps passing us by. She tells me that she usually gets picked up by car from the station, but that today she has to find her own way. She is headed to Rotak, the next major city, which is 40 kilometers down this road. I cross the road that bifurcates the metro station and <clears throat> come upon two security guards sitting on plastic chairs on the edge of the station premises. 
They say they work for the DMRC, and I can see from the insignia on their blue uniforms that they are contract security, not the central Indian security force guards that you see on trains and in stations. These guys are relaxed. A man in his 20s in faded jeans and a t-shirt and with a light blue backpack and slightly disheveled hair comes up to the guards. His name is Gulshan. He comes from Rotak and is headed to Gevra station, just a, a few stops away on, on the green line. He is asking the guards about job opportunities as a security guard. They start talking about when this metro line will reach the city of Rotak. The guards are sure it will. It's only a matter of time. Gulshan says, who knows if it will? It's up to the government. Just like this one came, we didn't know it was coming. The guards venture, if Congress comes, Congress is the opposition political party. If Congress comes, it'll come quickly. Congress brought the metro in the first place. If BJP, the current government, it will take time. I'm a little surprised to hear this assessment since Modi's BJP government since 2014 has taken credit for the metro through advertisements and ribbon cuttings with each new line opening and extension. In truth, both parties have supported the Delhi Metro and taken credit for it. I walk with Gulshan up to the metro station. He's come today looking for a job and will head to Gevra where there might be some possibilities. <clears throat> he tells me he might be a security guard until he finds something else. He is studying for the entrance exam to be a policeman in another city, Chandigarh, in the state of Punjab. But he keeps having to pay for coaching for the exam. Here, an hour and a half <clears throat> by metro from central Delhi, I feel I am further and further away and that the city is expanding. But as I talk to Gulshan, I see that for him, coming from Rotak and hoping <clears throat> to find work in Delhi's periphery, the city is contracting. He has reached the beginning of the line. Thank you.